right, everyone. Uh, welcome to Telos Band. Today, I am finally with uh, Dr. Cadell Last, and today we're going to be talking about Nietzsche. I'm not showing my face because it's pretty late, and I was about to go to bed, but um, I'm more than happy to uh, do this discussion uh, with Cadell. So this is sort of a death drive thing for me just risking it all <laughs> i took a melatonin as well so I mean, <laughs> it's uh, risky yeah. but anyways um yeah so we're going to be talking about nietzsche and maybe relating it to some other people uh that both me and Kyle have talked about like uh, zizek and hegel uh so maybe Kyle, do you want to first introduce uh, your interest in nietzsche and what you're doing with this uh, philosophy portal class or thing absolutely thanks for having me on trey um and yeah i've been a sort of a, a fan of your work uh I, I really like what what telos bound um represents i think it's absolutely necessary and uh it's great to see um just the next generation of young people really taking uh philosophy seriously and 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 uh, reinterpreting it for our time it's absolutely necessary um yeah so my work uh if you're interested in it can be found at, at philosophyportal.online uh, i'm going to be leading a course on nietzsche's thus spoke zarathustra which starts on july 15th and uh, my interest in in nietzsche has been um Long-standing, I've always been sort of uh, interested in Nietzsche's work, but really deep diving into it in the last few years, um, I'm just sort of taken by how open and honest Nietzsche is, how different his style is philosophically as it relates to most other philosophers, um, and also as it relates to sort of like a meta paradigmatics for the Western world. I think Nietzsche stands in a very unique position um, I would just um, maybe to give sort of a juxtaposition of his work as it relates to like some of the intellectuals who originally influenced me when I was growing up in my early 20s. In my early 20s, I was really interested in the new atheist movement. Um, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, um, and so forth. Um, and I think that although that movement really did identify something as it relates to certain dogmatic interpretations of, of religion. Um, I do think it leaves out a certain existential depth as it relates to the crisis and the death of God, a certain trauma, a certain negativity, a certain tragedy, um, which is fully alive and fully expressed in Nietzsche. Um, and I think that that is in general connected to in like the last five, six, seven years, um, the way in which I've gravitated towards continental philosophy of the last 200 years um, and, and, you know, really identifying that as sort of the horizon or the frontier of possible thought um, today. So you mentioned uh, negativity as something that Nietzsche may have missed a bit or didn't emphasize as much as certainly someone like uh, Hegel or Zizek today. So I'm wondering, um, firstly, how do you feel about this reading of Nietzsche, like a Deleuzian reading, where Nietzsche is this thinker of positivity, will to power, creativeness, activeness. Um, the way Deleuze frames him, he's sort of a complete opposite to, to Hegel. And in a way, it's interesting because it gets really complex, like is <laughs> Deleuze misinterpreting Nietzsche and Hegel or just Nietzsche or and uh, not Hegel or j just Hegel not Nietzsche or is he getting them right so what do you how do you feel about this do you think that this portrayal of Nietzsche as the ultimate anti-Hegelian in a way do you think this is a an accurate portrayal right I think it's this is a yeah really really great question um and I think a lot is at stake here um no doubt that the 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 you know Deleuze has had an enormous impact on 20th century philosophy and his interpretation of Nietzsche um, has has uh, also been uh, incredibly influential, and it does seem like the key distinction at work here is as it relates to negativity and affirmation. 
Um, I think that the way I'm trying to approach it is that when I read Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, it's hard not to notice that the entire story of Thus Spoke Zarathustra while leading up to a type of primordial affirmation is as story, and I think this is important, as story is structured by the negation of the negation. So like the, the best example I can give of that is the way in which the metaphor, uh, which really structures a lot of Thus Spoke Zarathustra of the camel, the lion, and the child, is a logic of spiritual transformation, uh, which operates on the negation of the negation. Uh, the camel uh, is a sort of negativity, which is negated for the lion, which works towards a pure affirmation of the child. So the really important dialectical point there is that, yes, there is a pure affirmation possible, but your pure affirmation would become uh, very impotent and actually potentially counterproductive to spiritual transformation if you don't include within it uh, the negation of the negation. So um, it's, it's, it's simply the fact that um, if you interpret Nietzsche where he ends, in other words, if paradoxically, if you don't take into consideration the becoming of uh, Zarathustra and Nietzsche's philosophy, then you can just posit some sort of pure affirmation. Um, but if you take into consideration the becoming of spirit, then you can't leave out negation of the negation. Um, the same thing applies to Nietzsche as it relates to the master-slave dialectic um, and the will to power, namely that yes, the will to power does transcend the master-slave dichotomy, uh, but not before working through uh, the master-slave dialectic. The master-slave dialectic is incredibly alive uh, throughout the whole of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So uh, what I'm ultimately here trying to say is in my own reading of Nietzsche, um, that you have to see him as working through core concepts in Hegel, namely the negation of the negation, the master-slave dialectic, and so forth. And yes, there is a beyond, which... I think Hegel would also agree with, namely that in the state of absolute knowing, um, you are kind of uh, a being that has worked through negation of negation and master-slave dialectic and so forth. So it, it, my interpretation is that Deleuze, um, in trying to set himself up as an anti-Hegelian, um, is in some sense opening up the conditions of possibility for people to think that it's okay to not work through Hegel. Whereas I think the point of the phenomenology of spirit, as Hegel himself says in the preface, is that um, it's kind of like a, a book which is important to have worked through in order to then become a, pro a philosopher proper, um, and then you can discard of it. But the, the, the cost or the price you pay if you don't work through the phenomenology of spirit, I think is incredibly high because the possibility is that you start uh, repeating Hegel without even realizing it. And I do think that that is uh, very much present in Deleuze's work. I think where he goes against Hegel, oftentimes he is becoming uh, the most Hegelian. Right, I, th I think I've heard uh, Zizek say um, something similar about, uh, about Deleuze. And as actually Lacan, he says that about Lacan. So that's an interesting uh, reading of Deleuze. Now you mentioned the, uh, what's it called? The three metamorphoses of spirit from thus spoke uh, Zarathustra. And what's interesting is that you use that as an example of negation of the negation. But for me, my reading of that um, like, and I don't have like many readings of certain passages. Like this is just like, one of the things I, the only things I've ever really taken from uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra and used, and that's that uh, it sort of, uh, uh, it sh shows that negation, there is no negation for Nietzsche, because the child, uh, ultimately, that's not uh, like a real negation in the 
Hegelian sense of like a coincidence of the opposites or like the, uh, an actual, because wouldn't that be more of like a progressive development from the camel to the lion to the child? Like even that movement itself, I don't think it consists of uh, a actual confrontation with negativity. And even so, like once we get to the child, you're sort of at this, like, as you said, like a pure affirmation of the will. But I think that's like, how do we get there? Wouldn't that sort of be like a sort of like an example of a, a fantasy and illusion for like Zizek? Like I'm trying to think in terms of a Zizekian and Hegelian perspective. Wouldn't that be a, a fantasy, the idea that we can somehow get like progressively evolve to this pure will? How does that actually function? Okay, well, let, let's 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 go through it. So, in terms of like the movement of actually confronting uh, with negativity, so like I think like the common reading of the camel lion child metamorphoses is that um, the camel is a metaphor for taking on a heavy load uh, for disciplining oneself. Uh, purely for its own sake. Um, so this, this disciplinary process, this carrying a heavy load process um, is um, in some sense, at least, at least how, how I'm interpreting it in terms of, and also how I've sort of observed it among certain individuals who, let's say, don't want to take on a heavy load and want to remain in a childlike state and this is something that appears throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra is the distinction between the child who has not become an adult and the adult who returns to the child. I think that's an important distinction. So in any case, this metaphor of the camel that disciplines oneself, that carries a heavy load for its own sake, um, is something, at least in my experience, I interpret as a confrontation with a certain negativity because it requires uh, abandoning the sort of lightness or the carefreeness of your original childhood. Um, the lion phase is a type of negation of this sort of discipline for discipline's sake or a type of carrying a heavy load for, a, for, for carrying a heavy load's sake um, because you don't really, you the spirit hasn't really investigated why it is carrying a heavy load or why it is disciplining itself. In other words, it's not really connected to its own desire. Um, and in order to be connected towards its own desire, it has to take risks. It has to challenge itself, go into the unknown, really figure itself out in terms of its desire in order, in order to go, go deeper into the spiritual process. So at least in sort of the way I'm making sense of this logic is that you, you, you have a certain original negativity at work in terms of if you want to become an adult, if you want to leave the original lightness or the original sort of timelessness of the child with the mother, um, that you do need to pick up some heavy object. You can think about like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a, up a hill or something like that. Um, and then sort of the negation of that would be the sort of the pursuit of like a your own desire, your own, your own, your own sort of passions. Um, and then only then after that, there is the, the opening up of a sort of potentiality of the pure affirmation. Now, is, is that pure affirmation just a fantasy or an illusion? Um, I think even in the work of Zizek, um, I can't really speak for Hegel on this, but in the work of Zizek, um, the status of fantasy and illusion is uh, also sort of um, ambiguous because uh, there is no sort of position where you are sort of non-phantasmatic or non-illusory. Like uh, in the Lacanian tradition, if you uh, traverse the fantasy, that doesn't mean you are in a non-phantasmatic state. It doesn't mean you are in a non-illusory state. It kind of, even in many readings, you're kind of more uh, overtaken by the fantasy, but you have a sort of a, let's say, at least in my reading, you have a sort of post Oedipal relationship to the fantasy, which I do think could be connected to this uh, reclaiming of the child in some sense, uh, in the sense that 
before you go through the spiritual metamorphoses of the lion, or sorry, before you go through the spiritual metamorphoses of the camel, the lion, and the child, you have an Oedipal relationship to fantasy, namely you have the fantasy of the lost mother. But after you've gone through the spiritual metamorphoses of the camel, the lion, and the child, um, I think there's the possibility of interpreting this as a post Oedipal relationship to a childlike wonder and joy. Um, at least that's a, an idea that I and enjoy okay, playing so, with. No, no, I think that's it's a very it's a very uh, good idea. And like, so I'm wondering, would the in a way would this passage from the child at the beginning you sort of have to go through this process and would the end product which is the child again would that be like the figure which is sort of reconciled with this process of negation to and that is like so it's like a return to the self but in a sublated form which is um you know reconciled with uh, its uh, contradictions and stuff yeah i mean for me, when I interpret like the, the nature of the overman, uh, I do see it as a concept which um, can be fitted nicely with Hegel's idea of absolute knowing. And I do see both of those concepts as including within themselves certain qualities that you could say uh, involve a perspectival shift on negativity, a perspectival shift on contradiction, a perspectival shift on um, also concepts like conflict or hardship or struggle. Um, I do think that following the phenomenology of spirit, there is kind of a way in which before one is in touch with absolute knowing, there is a type of um, disappointment when it comes to the failure of the object uh, as it relates to the sort of, let's say, the normies, as it relates to the overman or the rabble, as it relates to the overman in, in Nietzsche's work. I do think that there is a type of disappointment as it relates to a transcendental external support system that like most humans require some sort of transcendental external support system, an object which they can hold on to, which would provide safety or security for their identity in an otherwise disorienting and complex and disturbing world. Whereas in the stat, uh, in the psychological state of absolute knowing, or in the sort of psychological condition of the overman, I do think that there is a, let's say, a higher order reconciliation with negativity. That seems to open up. Okay, so so um, this uh, this status of the overman is equivalent to absolute knowing in a way you would argue. Um, and I'm wondering if. Do you think that, because um, I know you did a course on the phenomenology of spirit, so you're obviously familiar with Hegel, but you also read a, did a series on less than nothing, um, which, so you're obviously familiar with Zizek. And I don't know if, how you feel on this question of whether Zizek interprets Hegel correctly, but do you think that Nietzsche's Overman could be, um, in a way, um, um, similar to Hegel's absolute knowing, but Zizek's form of absolute knowing where it's just like the pure reconciliation with a negativity, like <laughs> the recognition that you can never, for example, like one example is stepping outside your finitude as a subject. Like that's one example of absolute knowing, like reconciliation with the antagonism. Would you say that there's any of that in Nietzsche's um, notion of the overman because one of the questions uh i was actually asked to ask you was do you think think that nietzsche has something equivalent to self-relating negativity in the um Zizekian and like lacanian and hegelian not even not lacanian hegelian tradition um so yeah, I, I think so. This is yeah, this is this is again, yeah, yeah, very, very important. So my reading of of both uh, all let's say, let's take all of these figures together, um, Hegel, Nietzsche, and Zizek. And and in this taking these three figures together, um, I do think it should be emphasized that 
the work on including Nietzsche within this sort of philosophical horizon is, I think, new territory. Um, it's not something that Zizek explicitly does. Uh, it is something that, that uh, one of Zizek's closest collaborators, Alenka Zupanchich, has, has uh, tried to uh, work on. Uh, she's written a book on, on Nietzsche. Um, and Lacan uh, does sort of refer to Nietzsche in ways that I interpret as synergistic, um, in which they, they build on each other. Um, and I do think Nietzsche is in general recognized as a sort of precursor and a friend to the larger psychoanalytic process. So I do think that there are lots of reasons to include all of these figures together. Um, but as it relates to like your specific uh, question here, um, is there sort of this uh, pure reconciliation with negativity in, in Nietzsche uh, as it relates to how you defined it in terms of a recognition that you can never step outside of your finitude as a subject? Um, I do think that I see this move uh, both explicitly in Hegel in the preface. Um, any meaningful engage, like the paradox in Hegel is that any meaningful engagement with infinity has to be done from the standpoint of finitude. So like, you know, the whole mistake in, in Hegel is the subject who tries to be, uh, have some sort of self-posited relationship to infinity, um, to step outside of their own finitude. He said, this is, this is where you lose uh, true infinity. Uh, this is, you know, Hegel uh, goes on in the science of logic to make the, I think, extremely important and profound distinction between bad infinity and true infinity. And I think that Nietzsche, I see Nietzsche as, and this is how I try to teach Nietzsche as, a, as I'm going to try and teach it in the Thus Spoke Zarathustra course. I think we can see Nietzsche as a true infinity in the Hegelian logic. Um, and that true infinity actually involves the paradox that you can never step outside of your finitude as a subject um, and that you reconcile yourself with antagonism. Um, and I think that there are many examples in Thus Spoke Zarathustra where we can see the overman as, precisely this figure. And I think that that's also the way Zupanchich reads Nietzsche as how we should read Nietzsche. She says, we shouldn't read Nietzsche as a, a sort of a unity under the overman. We should rather view Nietzsche as the moment in which one splits into two for an irreducible antagonism. And just to give a sort of an example of how Nietzsche himself would articulate this, he says, even the overman, the future overman that, that Nietzsche is calling for, he says, even the overman, would require the over dragon, namely that he would need some uh, enormous battle, some enormous confrontation with a with a with an enemy, with an opposite. So, would you say that the idea of the death of God, for example, um, in Zizek's reading, it's this idea that. Uh, well, essentially that there is no big other, right? Or the big other, other is itself uh, barred, inconsistent, antagonistic. And uh, so there's no ability to depend on that other. So that's essentially what's lost with the death of God um, is this dependency upon an external uh, transcendent other. And I think in the same, that's essentially the same thing for, for Nietzsche. So I mean, I think this area of the death of God is probably where the connections between Nietzsche and Hegel um, would be probably very fruitful because, I mean, they both use similar terminology even, and I don't think they're, they're that uh, conceptually distinct. So how would you even read Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God? Because um, just uh, uh, there's one... Uh, uh, video I made on uh, Levi Bryant's understanding of it, and it's essentially that God is the form or or essence or identity, the one. And when you get to this purely, um, uh, it, when you get into a reality that's purely imminent, there's no other, no big other anymore. And you get a uh, flawed and inconsistent reality. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering, how do you read the the death of God? Right. Yeah, in 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 Nietzsche, it's it's explicitly about the loss of perfect being, 
So like any idea that we could have a relationship with a perfect other, um, an other that can depend on, you can, I mean, in psychoanalytic terms, you could interpret this as a, the relics of the um, infantile psyche's relationship with the womb or the infantile psyche's relationship with the original relationship with the mother as some sort of dependency that you have. You can depend on this other, like even think about what it would be like to exist inside a womb. And we often don't think about the fact that all of us start in such a condition for a long period of time. And it's kind of like a, you know, the starting point, the starting conditions for all of our psychological uh, processes, which open up after birth. In any case, Nietzsche is basically saying that we can no longer hold this childlike image of a perfect being um, and that we have to undergo that mo mo a lot of what the overman is about is confronting the imperfection of being and to still show up and shine, to still show up and shine for others. So because there's no other in the big O sense, the real challenge is to shine up for others and that that requires an extraordinarily difficult spiritual transformation process because it's hard to it's hard to uh, exist in in this world and it's hard to exist in relationship to how imperfect other people are and 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 so like for example the first um, major confrontation that, that Zarathustra's character has is, is with a saint in the woods. And this saint in the woods says, uh, don't go to humans. Humans are imperfect. I can't go to humans. Humans would kill me. Uh, humans are, are so imperfect, they're fatal to me. Um, and he says, instead, love animals or love God and love animals, the saint says. And, and Nietzsche sort of, you know, respects sort of what the saint in the woods is saying, but, you know, mostly muses to himself um, about how the saint doesn't yet know that God is dead and so forth. And, and but what I, what I interpret this to mean is that, and like what I've seen in my own life is like, I do think that people can use God and use the, the can use their self posit. this is crucial. People can use their self posited concept of God and people can use um, animals, their pets and so forth, as a way to escape the reality of dealing with the imperfection of other people and building real deep sort of relationships, uh, what, what sort of Nietzsche would point towards as sort of companions or friendships. You know, a friend is someone that Nietzsche sees as someone who can bestow an entire world um, as opposed to the neighbor who's just sort of someone you might gossip with or, or share sort of little superficial aspects of your reality and so forth. Um, so I hope that gives sort of a perspective on at least how Nietzsche is um, thinking about this. No, oh, yeah, that was great. And actually, um, that was such a good point um, uh, about, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking. <laughs> I'm a little tired. Um, you're talking about, uh, yeah, the um, animals and God, right? So like, you know how instead of conf getting into real relationships with real people, you sort of um, uh, get lost in, <laughs> you know, uh, not real people. And the thing that I was actually thinking about was um, there's a whole debate, and this will seem off topic, but it really isn't. Um, uh, it, there's a whole debate um, between Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox Christians about um, sacraments, and particularly the sacrament of confession. And Protestants will be like, why do you need to confess in front of a priest who is a, a mediator? Why do you need a mediator? Why can't you go right to God and confess your sins? And I think that what came to me, and I'm sure this has been said before, it, it just seems so obvious to me is that um, like you have an easier time confessing your sins than confessing in front of a priest. So that means that you, ha you don't have a personal relationship with God yet. So I think the real Christian um, vision of a spiritual journey is that th you no longer need this mediation, but at the beginning you, uh, you essentially do. And I guess the point here is that um, I think this is an example of 
a sort of common uh, cultural Christian who's like, yeah, I pray every now and then I confess to God. It's not a real belief. And that's something, of course, uh, Jordan Peterson talks about a lot, how Christians, they confess to believe these very crazy things, honestly, but they're not living like they do. So um, would you say that Nietzsche sort of provides a real path or a, a way to live your life uh, that will lead to a sort of growth and uh, a positive change and like a real conviction to the way you live your life and not just sort of like a ground, the groundlessness of a modern consumerist existence. Um, well, like as it, so as it relates to does, does Nietzsche provide a, a real path and a way to live a life towards growth outside of consumerism, I think, uh, I mean, Absolutely. We, I mean, we, we can always use books or intellectual work in a, in a superficial way, right? Like, which I think you're potentially, and, and we can always form identities, which are contradictory as it relates to what we say we believe and what, how we're actually acting. Um, so like, I think that's, that might be a little bit what you're pointing towards with Christians professing to believe crazy things, but not living like they do. But I mean, I think if you read Nietzsche very close to the body, namely, if you read Nietzsche very close to the way you're living your life, um, I do think that you get a type of ground which is constantly calling for self-overcoming and constant attention to the discord within yourself, the loneliness within yourself, the you know, the, the, the cracks within yourself, which, which are the positive material for that self overcoming. And, and, and certainly it, 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 it's a type of that sort of relationship, if you're willing to sort of embody that ethic, so to speak, um, which I would sort of say is a post Kantian ethic, um, does, uh, let's say, attempt to work beyond both the ground of the state and the market. And I think that that's something that I hope to bring out in the Thus Book Zarathustra course is that Nietzsche is not a friend of either the state or the market in, in, my, in my reading. Um, he, 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 I think, quite elegantly expresses caution to ground yourself in a type of market-based consumerism. He also cautions you against grounding yourself in, in state identification. Um, so, uh, he's pointing beyond both and, and towards the overman and, uh, yeah, I mean, to actually include that within your own life process, like it, it, it requires huge hurdles and challenges, right? Like, so for example, like if I was embedding my identity inside the state, it would kind of be me intellectually submitting to the university because the university is state funded. Um, it would be me submitting to the structures and the hierarchies of the state in that regard. Uh, you know, the fact that I didn't do that, the fact that I was sort of more trying to carve out, you know, my own sort of intellectual trajectory um, also means that I have to confront the paradoxes and the mess of the market, which produces whole new problems and whole new challenges, um, you know, of trying to like, for example, market, you know, something that I think is divine or something that I think is sacred, which contradicts, I think, the whole principles of the noisiness and the, the, the absurdity of market dynamics and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it Really, if you read Nietzsche close to the bone, close to the body, close to the blood, um, yeah, you, you, you are given a type of ground, but it's not a ground which is sort of like a safe place to be. It's kind of he, the word he the metaphor he uses in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which I like quite a lot, is um, he says free spirits build their nest out of an abyss. So that's the ground. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was actually just thinking, uh, like the ground is sort of this self-propelling wheel, the way yeah. Nietzsche describes the child. Um, I, you made such a good point about um, the market, how Nietzsche doesn't really um, fall into the uh, logic of the state or the market. Um, and it's interesting in the parable of the madman, Nietzsche 
who who are the ones laughing at him who is proclaiming the death of God? It's the people at the market. And these people at the market, they are atheists. Like they they don't believe in God. They laugh at the madman for talking about God, but in a way they haven't um what you were talking talking about, like confronting. They haven't confronted the depth of their their own convictions. So I can sort of see how um uh, as you how this would relate to this idea of constructing your uh, your ground being your own abyss it's sort of like you're confronting that the fact that what the madman has confronted in a way and Nietzsche and the overman is that there is no ground for you to um for you to receive that you actually have to build it for yourself and I think this is sort of this idea of the self-propelling wheel so do you do you think that this is um do you do you think that this is actually possible really <laughs> and do you think like if we could go like maybe quickly into like concrete ways that you could attain to something like this what would that consist of yeah like i think this is a super interesting interesting topic um i'll try to make a connection here with um something that that Zizek talks about in Hegel in a wired brain as it relates to the impossibility of bootstrapping yourself out of your own yeah like sort of bootstrapping yourself out of your own abyss the interesting paradox at least in the way I well I think this is true to Zizek in philosophy at least it's the way I'm interpreting Zizek in philosophy um it's the relationship and I think this is a really important and 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 useful double move um, it's the relationship between epistemological failure and ontological impossibility. Um, so this sort of, I think, is sort of Zizek's like, this is, these are two concepts which I think are central to, to Zizekian philosophy. And I think they apply to this dimension of the self-propelling wheel. Um, the self-propelling wheel is something which sees the truth of its epistemology or the truth of its knowledge in failure. So that's the epistemological failure angle. In other words, you don't get uh, too identified with the positive correctness of your uh, own knowledge. Um, it's not that you don't know things or it's not that you don't like have correct ideas in some dialectical sense, um, but you're sort of focused on where the crack is or you're focused on where you are not quite sure um, about whether you're right. Like, so for example, like I could give sort of like examples of like what that looks like in my own epistemological scaffolding, like sort of where I feel like oh, I'm not really, I don't really know if I'm correct here. I don't know really if my interpretation is right here, or, you know, this will take me a few years to figure out, you know, like this type of thing that goes on maybe in, you know, in my own sort of working through my own philosophy. And then you have the ontological impossibility dimension, which is sort of the impossibility to fully be yourself, like the impossibility to fully be, you know, your, your, your identity. Um, like, so for example, uh, many sort of traditional metaphysical views in the Hegelian tradition, um, you know, in the science of logic, Hegel talks about this in relationship to Spinoza, um, is that, you know, you can never really have a complete full ontology, a, a complete full picture of substance um, in Hegel's reading of Spinoza, for example, because, because of the self-relation, because the, the cat in like, so again, to use Hegel's words, the categories of essence are at themselves in a historical dialectic. So there is a sort of ontological impossibility uh, at, at work. So basically I'm trying to say that when we think about this self-propelling wheel, I think we have to think about the ways in which we are always striving in relationship to ultimately the impossible. And I think at least Zizek's interpretation of magic is that sometimes the impossible becomes possible. You know, sometimes, you know, like that, that the, the subject striving in this way sort of retroactively defines the coordinates of its own becoming. So for example, like, um, like I'll just, again, use a personal example. So like when I was, and this might be useful for, for maybe you or maybe uh, people who follow your channel who might be in a similar situation. Um, when I sort of realized that 
the entire university path or when I realized the entire university trajectory was a pyramid scheme where it was sort of not based on meritocracy, where it was sort of systematically um, coercive and manipulative and conformist and, 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 and sort of anti a genuine creative um, spirit. Um, I realized that I would have to sort of create the foundations for something outside the university. And that appeared like an ontological impossibility. Like, how can you bring philosophy to the marketplace? Or how can you bring philosophy to the market and be beyond the market at the same time? Right? Like, it seems like an impossible task. It seems like my entire epistemology would have to go through enormous failure in order to do that. Now, I'm trying to do that, but I don't know if I'll succeed. But if it does succeed, then it will retroactively define the conditions. I will have retroactively defined the conditions of my own becoming in relationship to what I perceived as an ontological impossibility. And through that process, all of my epistemological scaffolding will be transformed and so forth. So in any case, that's how I'm making sense of this. I hope that that was somehow clear. Yeah, that was helpful, but um, I just right at the beginning, kind of, I'm not sure um, if I'm just missing something when it comes to this idea of uh, that you you explained it really well, better than I can explain about um, the kind of sort of incomplete totality, the way because of the very self-relation, it can't become complete. Um, like to me, the way Nietzsche defines um, the self, self-propelling wheel is the will willing its will its own its own self so to me wouldn't isn't that sort of the ultimate like i notion of a pure self-relation like it is the will which is actively willing itself to continue like so to me i so you get what i'm saying right i I see what you're saying now yeah i think i think yeah and this is really clever i i so i so here's here's where like it, it could, it could, it could be. So this is an example of like an area where like I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to interpret uh, this, but like it's obvious that Nietzsche himself saw himself as continuing the tradition of Spinoza, and Spinoza definitely has in his metaphysics this notion of a self cause. I don't know how to pronounce it in the original terms, but it's like a causa sui or it's like the actual technical definition, but the, the, the concept is trying to get at this notion of a, a self-cause. And it seems to me anyway, like this is in contradiction with uh, Lacan's notion of the object cause of desire. So in other words, that you don't, and this is something that Zizek would emphasize very strongly, is that you don't cause yourself, you're caused by the object petia. So like, I think like if there is like an interesting project at like sort of thinking the contradictions between let's say like a, a Nietzsche and a Lacan or like a, a Spinoza and a Hegel, it's in relation. And I've like written, a, there's a whole chapter in Less Than Nothing about this, that there's a, a video on the distinction between Spinoza and Hegel for anyone that's interested in diving into that. But um, yeah, this distinction between the self cause um, and the uh, object cause um, sort of the cause by your own lack or, or, or something like that um, is, I think, a minimal distinction which has yet to receive the philosophical attention that it probably deserves and uh, probably something interesting would come out of investigating that. Okay, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and with that, I think that's a pretty uh, good way to end it off. Um, so now we're just going to be going into the three questions I have for you that this section is for patrons only. So uh, for the public audience, this is probably where it will cut off. We forgot to uh, really give any conclusions uh, to uh, the interview. So uh, thank you for coming on. Dr. Cadell last. Uh, so we had you on to talk about Nietzsche because you're doing or starting a Nietzsche course very soon. It will be probably tomorrow for the people watching. So uh, quickly tell us 
about that and where uh, people can sign up for that or check it out? Yeah, so um, the Nietzsche course will be the second course I've given through Philosophy Portal. You can find it, uh, more about that at philosophyportal.online. Um, we're going to be doing a nine-week deep dive into Thus Spoke Zarathustra, going into all four of the parts in sort of the depth I think that they deserve. Um, there will be sort of live presentations and also collective discussion spaces. Um, and it will all be organized creatively towards the creation of a student-led conference and a student-led anthology. So if you're interested in sort of not only getting a sort of comprehensive view of Nietzsche's philosophy, but also interested in um, contributing to the future of philosophical interpretation and Nietzsche Nietzschean philosophy um, and exploring your own ideas, this will be a great opportunity. Um, to do so. And I think it, it, it offers a sort of unique mix from what I've seen in, in, from the first uh, course I led on Phenomenology of Spirit, because many conferences and many journals and many um, collective works, um, they actually aren't usually with participants who have been through a common process together and sort of have a sort of reason to sort of interact and sort of collaborate with each other. And I think that this style of course does lend itself to that so if you're interested uh yeah there find out more at philosophyportal.online and in terms of my own sort of gravitation towards Nietzsche and teaching this course is that I do think that and hopefully was able to communicate a little bit in the podcast that uh there's an underexplored connection between Nietzsche's work and and Hegel's work and uh, that that has enormous consequences for interpreting 20th century philosophy. Um, so I think that there's a lot of uh, work to be done, as I sort of alluded to at the end of this podcast with the distinction between self-cause and the object cause. That's a, that's a good example. Uh, there's huge, huge ideas here. So philosophyportal.online. All right, and that is linked in the description along with your YouTube channel, which has uh, so many uh, excellent lectures, which uh, occupied me as I was uh, painting last summer. I would just listen to <laughs> your lectures amongst uh, many others. So, uh, yeah, so um, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, it was completely last minute. So, <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I appreciate your time. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you um you know, sometime and I'll send you the link for this. I'll get this uh, edited uh, right away. All right, man. See ya. Thanks a lot. Best of luck.